In this video, we'll talk about linear transformations on Rn. Much of what we discuss will also apply to linear transformations on a general vector space. So here's the definition of a linear transformation. A linear transformation, or linear function, from Rn to Rm is a function, t, with the following properties. For all x and y in Rn and all scalar c, t of x plus y is equal to t of x plus t of y. In other words, you can think of this as distributing the t to the x and the y. We'll refer to this property as additivity, and we'll also say that t is additive. 2. t of a scalar c times x is equal to c times t of x. In other words, you can pull that scalar in front of the t. We'll refer to this property as homogeneity. We'll also say that t is homogeneous. This definition actually applies in all vector spaces. That is, if Rn and Rm are replaced by any vector spaces, we still get the same definition of linear transformation. I'll point out that for this function t, Rn is the domain of the function, and Rm is the codomain of the function. Here's an example. So we'll define t from r into r, that is r1 into r1, by the following formula, t of x is equal to 2x. Now why is this linear? So we have to prove the properties additivity and homogeneity. For additivity, we have t of x plus y is equal to 2 times x plus y, which is equal to 2x plus 2y, distributing that 2. And this is t of x plus t of y. Therefore, additivity holds. And t of a constant c times x is just 2 times c times x, which by the commutative and associative property multiplication is equal to c times 2x, which equals c times t of x. In summary, we've shown that t is additive and homogeneous and therefore linear. Here's another example. Define s from r into r by the following formula. s of x is equal to 2x plus 1. So try this on your own. Show that s is not a linear function. That is, show that s is not additive and or not homogeneous and therefore not linear. Put this on pause and we'll check answers together. So here's the solution. Let's check additivity. Additivity means that s of x plus y had better equal s of x plus s of y. So let's check this. Let's see if this is true. On the left side here, s of x plus y is equal to 2 times x plus y plus 1, by definition of s, and that's equal to 2x plus 2y plus 1. On the right side, we have s of x is equal to 2x plus 1, and s of y is equal to 2y plus 1. So simplifying, we have 2x plus 2y plus 2 on the right side, and these two cannot equal one another, because if 2x plus 2y plus 1 equals 2x plus 2y plus 2, subtracting 2x and 2y on both sides, we have 1 on the left and 2 on the right and those can't equal one another. And therefore, S is not additive, and so it can't be linear. Note that we could have as well shown that S is not homogeneous, and therefore not linear. So S is not linear by the formal definition of linear, but then why in introductory algebra courses do we refer to such functions of the form like mx plus b as linear functions? The answer is that the graphs of these functions are lines, and that's where the original terminology linear came from. However, starting with linear algebra, we stop calling these functions linear, but instead refer to them as affine functions when b is not equal to zero. An affine function is a linear function plus a constant. Here are some pictures. On the left we have an affine function, and on the right we have a linear function. So a linear function has the property that f of 0 is equal to 0. 
In other words, the graph passes through the origin. For an affine function, the graph does not pass through the origin. So note that if t from rn to rm is linear, then automatically t of 0 has got to equal 0. So this is true in general, not just from r into r, but from rn into rm. And why is this the case? Because t of 0, the 0 vector, is equal to t of 0, the constant 0, times the 0 vector. We can pull the 0, the constant 0 out in front. And by homogeneity, that's equal to 0 times t of the 0 vector, which is it's equal to the 0 vector because the constant 0 times any vector is equal to the 0 vector. Here's a formal definition of affine function. A function s from rn into rm is affine if s of x is equal to t of x plus some constant vector b for all x in rn, where t is a linear transformation. Here's an example. A linear transformation from R2 into R3 can be defined as follows. T of x equals this matrix, 3 by 2 matrix, times x for all x in R2. We'll refer to this matrix as A. Now why is this linear? So to prove additivity, let's take a look at t of x plus y. This equals, by definition, this matrix A times x plus y. By our rules of matrix multiplication, we can distribute the A to the x and the y to get AX plus AY. And this equals t of x plus t of y. Therefore, t is additive. To check homogeneity, let's take a look at t of c times x, where c is any scalar. This equals a times c times x. And again, by our rules of matrix multiplication, we can pull the c out in front to get c times a x, which equals c times t of x. Therefore, t is homogeneous. In summary, since t is additive and homogeneous, t is linear. Let's check this on some particular vectors. Let's look at t of the vector 1, 1 plus 0, 1. And let's check to see whether this is equal to t applied to the vector 1, 1 plus t applied to the vector 0, 1. In other words, are both these sides equal? So on the left hand side, we can write this as t of 1, 2, just adding those two vectors together. And now let's apply the definition of t. t of 1, 2 and t of 1, 1 and t of 0, 1 are just the matrix we defined above applied to all those vectors. We can compute each one of these products separately. On the left we get 1, 2, negative 2. We get 1, 2, negative 2.5 in the middle. And on the right we get 0, 1, 0.5, we want to know is that left vector equal to the sum of the right two vectors. When we add the two vectors on the right, we get the vector on the left, and therefore this equation is true. In general, every m by n matrix A can be used to define a linear transformation from Rn into Rm as follows. We define t of x equal to a times x. By reasoning identical to what we used above, it's straightforward to show that t is additive and homogeneous and therefore linear. Here's a common point of confusion. Notice that we have an m by n matrix, so m is first when we define the matrix. But t maps rn into rm, so over here n is first. This reversal is something that one must keep in mind. So conversely, it turns out that every linear transformation from Rn into Rm can be written this way. 
That is, if T is any linear transformation from Rn into Rm, then there is always a unique m by n matrix, let's call it A, such that T of x is always equal to A times x. And that applies for all vectors in Rn. We'll see the reason for this by looking at the following example. Suppose that T from R3 to R2 is a linear transformation which satisfies T of the first basis vector E1, which is equal to T of 1, 0, 0. That's just E1. Is equal to 3, comma 1. And T of the next two standard basis vectors E2 and E3 are given by these equations. T of E2 is equal to negative 2, comma 4. T of E3 is equal to 0, comma 7. Then we can compute T of x for any vector x1, x2, x3 in R3 as follows. Write out x in this form. x is equal to x1 times the first basis vector, that's e1, plus x2 times the second basis vector, e2, plus x3 times the third basis vector, which is e3. So writing this out a little bit more symbolically, you get x1, e1, plus x2, e2, plus x3 times e3. Therefore, t of x equals t of that entire expression. And we can pull the x's out in front because they're constants. That's homogeneity that we're using. That's equal to x1 times t of e1, which is 3, 1. x2 times t of e2, which is negative 2, 4 plus x2 times t of e3, which is 0, 7. And we can write this as this matrix times the vector x1, x2, x3. This follows from the definition of matrix multiplication. Therefore, we've written t as a matrix A times x. And this is going to be our general template for finding this matrix. Where did it come from? We can write A as a matrix formed by the columns T of E1. That's our first column. Second column is T of E2. And third column is T of E3. The T should not have an arrow over it. It's a typo. And we're going to call this the standard matrix of T. So to generalize this to any transformation from Rn into Rm, T of x is going to equal a matrix A times x, where A is the standard matrix. Its columns are formed by T of E1, T of E2, all the way down to T of En. Again, this is called the standard matrix. And E1, just to remind you, is the vector. It's got a 1 in the first slot. E2 has a 1 in the second slot. And En has a 1 in the last slot. So for example, Suppose u from r2 into r4 is a linear transformation, and u of the first basis vector is equal to 1, negative 1, 0 pi. u of the second basis vector, e2, equals 0, 1, negative 3, 6. The standard matrix of u is therefore, its first column is going to be u of E1, which is 1, negative 1, 0 pi. And second column is U of E2, 0, 1, negative 3, 6. The standard matrix now allows us to compute U of any vector, for example, U of the vector 1, comma 3, by simply multiplying the standard matrix times that vector. And in this case, you get this vector. 
We see that the standard matrix is therefore very useful for computing, as in the above example. So here's a summary. There's a one-to-one -one correspondence between linear transformations from Rn into Rm and m by n matrices. Each linear transformation corresponds to a single matrix, and each matrix corresponds to a linear transformation. Specifically, the matrix is given by just the standard matrix of T. If we know how T behaves on a basis, we can form the standard matrix. So T of X is equal to A times X for all X in Rn. This completes our algebraic introduction to linear transformations. The algebraic approach leads to a very concrete way of expressing linear transformations in terms of multiplication by a fixed matrix, but it leaves something to be desired in terms of visualization. So here's a more intuitive approach to linear transformations, which is more visual. This approach uses geometry to define linear transformations. So here's the properties of linear transformations again. Additivity, t of x plus y. This means first add x and y, then apply t. On the right-hand side, we have t of x plus t of y. This means first separately apply t to x and y, then add the results. You'll get the same final result if t is linear. What does this mean geometrically? The expression on the left side tells us to first add, then map. Map means apply t. Let's try to visualize this. In Rn, we have a vector x. And a vector y. Let's add them together using the parallelogram rule. We get this vector x plus y. Then let's map it over to Rm using t. And say we get a vector t of x plus y. Now let's first map and add. That's what the right-hand side of the equation tells us to do. So here's our vectors in Rn. Let's map them using t. x gets sent to a vector t of x, say down here y gets sent to a vector t of y. Now let's add those results using the parallelogram rule. And again, we get a vector t of x plus t of y. And additivity is telling us that these must be the same vector. So that's a geometric way of thinking about additivity. So two, homogeneity t of c times x is equal to c times t of x. The left side of the equation is telling us to first scale x and then apply t. The right side says apply t first, then scale, and again homogeneity tells us that these must be the same final result. Let's try to visualize this. First scale, then map. So in Rn we have a vector x. Let's scale it. So here's a vector c times x pointing in the same direction. Then let's map it. So this gets mapped over to, say, this vector, which is t of c times x. Now let's first map and scale. We start with x, and we map it first using t. Let's say that gets mapped over here. This is t of x. Let's now scale t of x using c. So this scales out to c times t of x. Homogeneity guarantees that these must be the same vector. So again, this is a geometric way of visualizing homogeneity. How does this geometric picture help us? Consider the following example. Let t be a map from R2 into R2, which rotates vectors 90 degrees counterclockwise. 
To visualize this function, consider a vector x. We're going to apply t to x. We start with x, and we end up with a vector that's the same length as x, only rotated 90 degrees in the counterclockwise direction. That's our t of x. And again, we're going from R2 into R2. So thinking only about geometry, it's straightforward to see that T is linear. We have to prove additivity and homogeneity. Additivity means we can first add, then rotate. In other words, we have a vector x and a vector y. And we can add these two vectors getting the vector x plus y, and then rotate, in other words, apply t, to get a new vector, which is t of x plus y. Or we can first rotate, then add. So we rotate these two vectors. And rotating them 90 degrees counterclockwise, we end up with t of x. and t of y. Now we can add these two vectors and we get t of x plus t of y and it's straightforward to see that these are the same vector. Therefore t is additive. Why is t homogeneous? Well, let's first scale, then rotate. Let's first take a vector x, scale it by scalar c, and then apply t. Now, applying t means rotating it 90 degrees counterclockwise. So this is the vector t of c of x, t of the scaled vector. Or we can first rotate, then scale. So let's take x. apply t to x. In other words, rotate x by 90 degrees counterclockwise. Here's t of x. And now scale it. So this is c times t of x. And again, we get the same vector. So therefore, t is homogeneous. To sum up, using Purely geometric means we've shown that T is additive and homogeneous and therefore T is a linear transformation. We didn't present a matrix. We only described the geometric action of T on vectors. So the advantage of the geometric approach is that it allows us to easily define and visualize certain linear transformations, such as rotation. The advantage of the algebraic approach using the standard matrix that allows us to easily compute t of x for any input vector x. A natural question is what is the standard matrix of the above linear transformation that is rotation 90 degrees counterclockwise in R2? So the standard matrix again is going to have columns t of E1 and t of E2. So let's go ahead and find these vectors. E1 is the vector 1, 0. E2 is the vector 0, 1. So let's take a look at E1. And what happens when you rotate it 90 degrees counterclockwise? You get a new vector, and this is T of E1. So t of e1 is just equal to e2, which is the vector 0, 1. So we know the first column of our standard matrix. e2 starts out being here, and when we rotate it 90 degrees counterclockwise, we end up with t of e2, which is this vector, just negative e1. 
So t of e2 is equal to the vector negative e1, which is negative 1, comma 0. So those are the two columns of our standard matrix. Fill in those two columns. We get 0, 1 for the first column, negative 1, 0 for the second column. And that's our standard matrix for rotation 90 degrees counterclockwise in the plane. Try the following on your own. Compute the vectors in R2 that result from rotating by 90 degrees counterclockwise the following vectors. The vector negative 3, comma 5, and the vector 8, comma 26. Put the video on pause. We'll check answers together. So here's the solutions. So negative 3, comma 5 gets mapped to a vector t of negative 3, comma 5. To compute t, we just simply multiply by the standard matrix. 0, 1, negative 1, 0, times the vector 3, comma 5. Do the matrix multiplication, and you get negative 5, negative 3. So that's a rotated vector. 2, 8, comma 26 gets mapped to t of 8, comma 26. Again, multiply by the standard matrix. And we obtain the vector negative 26, comma 8. It's a good exercise to draw these input-output pairs and verify that they're perpendicular because the outputs are rotated by 90 degrees from the inputs. In general, rotation by an angle theta in R2, where theta greater than 0 means counterclockwise, less than 0 means clockwise, is a linear transformation with standard matrix given by cosine theta, sine theta, negative sine theta, cosine theta. For example, when theta is 90 degrees, as in the above example, cosine theta is equal to 0, sine theta is equal to 1, so we get a matrix identical to the one we derived above. When theta is 30 degrees, Cosine theta is square root of 3 over 2, sine theta is 1 half, and we get this matrix. This example underscores the difference between the geometric and algebraic approach. Geometrically, it's easier to define and visualize a transformation that rotates angles by 30 degrees. Algebraically, it's easier to compute with the standard matrix. For example, we can use that matrix in graphics software to rotate objects in the plane by 30 degrees. Here's another geometric approach that gives us a powerful way of visualizing linear transformations from R2 into R2. Every linear transformation has the following properties. T of 0 is equal to 0. And 2, T maps equally spaced parallel lines to equally spaced parallel lines. For example, these equally spaced parallel line segments get mapped by T to four other equally spaced parallel line segments, possibly with different spacing and direction. It turns out that these two geometric properties are equivalent to saying that T is linear. So how does this help us? For example, if T is rotation by 30 degrees counterclockwise in the plane, T takes a coordinate grid like this, and rotates it to a new coordinate grid where this angle here is 30 degrees. Thinking of vectors as points in the plane, this gives us a visualization of the action of t on all vectors in R2. So the standard matrix is given by this. We've worked this out. We did this above. This is square root of 3 over 2, 1 half, negative 1 half, square root of 3 over 2. So again, the geometric approach allows us to visualize the action of the linear transformation. The algebraic approach using the standard matrix allows us to easily compute the rotated vectors. Consider this example. We're going to draw a picture of the action of this linear transformation starting with a coordinate grid. 
So here's our transformation, mapping it to a new grid. The horizontal lines are unchanged, but the vertical lines get slanted by this linear transformation. So again, we're seeing equally spaced vertical lines getting mapped to equally spaced slanted lines. So our vector E1 gets mapped to the same vector E1. So T of E1 is just equal to E1. E2, on the other hand, gets mapped to the slanted vector T of E2. To write down the vector T of E2 in terms of E1 and E2, let's drop down this vertical line segment. So again, T of E1 is just equal to E1. And that's the vector 1, 0. On the other hand, T of E2 has components in the E1 and E2 direction. So let's say it's E2 plus 1 half times E1. This is the vector 1 half comma 1. Therefore, the standard matrix of T is 1, 0, 1 half, 1. And we call this a shear transformation. This linear transformation, for example, would be useful in graphics for creating italics. The block letter I would get mapped to a slanted version of the letter I, where the vertical segment gets slanted, but the horizontal segments stay horizontal. Here's a summary of our two approaches to defining and understanding linear transformations. Linear transformations from Rn into Rm can be defined concretely or algebraically by giving an explicit formula in terms of an m by n matrix A, that is t of x is equal to A times x, or abstractly. This is a more qualitative description, such as giving geometric properties of the linear transformation. For example, rotation by 15 degrees counterclockwise. The advantage of the algebraic approach is that it facilitates computing. It also allows us to easily determine properties of the linear transformation, such as is it 1, 1, or on 2. In contrast, the advantage of the abstract approach is that it allows for a more vivid visualization and a more intuitive description of the action of t on vectors. We often go back and forth between these two approaches to fully understand and utilize linear transformations.